Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And today we have a very special episode. It's a first. We have gone for a roundtable discussion with not one, not two, not three, not four, not yeah, five, five. <laughs> Almost carried on counting. Then we've got five uh, different BBL owners. We are joined by the Leicester Riders, Ruff- Russell Levinston, the Newcastle Eagles, Paul Blake, Sheffield Sharks, uh, Yuri Matishan, I believe is how you pronounce his surname, Plymouth Riders, Richard Mollard, and uh, London Lions, Vince McCauley, to discuss all things BBL, what goes on behind the scenes into running a professional franchise, and also what goes on into running the league because the league is actually owned by the clubs. I did put it out on social media last night um, asking for uh, any suggestions of questions and topics. I received well over 50 of them and I definitely couldn't get to all of them even though we did go for two hours. But it was a super insightful conversation with a lot of uh, nitty gritty details which I don't think um, generally you find elsewhere. So I hope that it will be as insightful for you as it was enjoyable for me uh, to get into that stuff. Before we do get into the show, please do go and check out our Patreon account, uh, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x. That's patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. There you can sign up to give us a monthly contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing around British basketball. We are trying to build a British basketball media empire and we cannot do it without you, our audience, the people that are listening to this, supporting us. So please go and check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. That helps fund all of this stuff that we're doing, all of this equipment, all of the time uh, that goes into it. Uh, it would be much appreciated. If you're listening on iTunes, uh, please take two seconds to go and give us a rating and review. Uh, you can do it on your phone. Stop right now and take two seconds to go and do that. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, please subscribe and leave a comment with, with your thoughts below uh, and I'll respond. And if you want get to get to me privately, uh, you can reach me on my email address sam at hoopsfix.com i reply to every single one um, or you can hit me up on every single social media platform at hoopsfix anyway that is enough from me uh, here is this week's very special episode roundtable discussion with bbl owners um, from the london lions plymouth raiders newcastle eagles leicester riders and sheffield sharks All right, guys, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Like, this is a first. Obviously, had a few technical uh, snags to, to begin with, but we're here. So I think the, 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 the first place to start is just to give people context uh, of who you guys are and, and what you do. And I think before we get into sort of the deeper conversations about running a BBL club, it's important that people understand um, the, the, specifics, the specific situation of each of your clubs. So can we start kind of by introducing yourself, who you are, uh, which club you're affiliated with, and I guess some background of that club, how long you've existed, maybe um, the sort of the setup, the number of staff, uh, whether or not you've got your own facility, so that someone that's watching this that maybe doesn't have that much of an in-depth background of the BBL can kind of understand, okay, this is where each person is coming from and where you sit in relation to maybe another franchise. Russ, we'll start with you, and then, uh, like I said before the call, when you finish, if you then hand over to the next guy, sort of hand over the, the, the flag and then they can they can uh, do their piece. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so my name is Russell Levinson. I'm managing director. Um, I'm one of the owners at Leicester Riders. Um, we're a, a team that was founded in 1967 at Loughborough University by Loughborough students. Um, and we, I've been involved with the club for 13 years. Uh, more recently, uh, you'd have seen the new opening of the Morningside Arena. Um, and uh, at the moment, we have around about 40 staff um, and uh, we're a, a club that has, I suppose, three sides to us, the professional club, the arena, um, and then our charity and our foundation. Um, so I'll pass over to Paul uh, to tell about his. Thanks, Russ. Um, so I'm Paul Blake, uh, managing director and owner of Newcastle Eagles and also chairman of the Eagles Community Foundation. Uh, we have been operating as Newcastle Eagles since 1996, so it's our 25th season as the Eagles. Franchise precedes that with um, a team that operated out of Sunderland for um, 20 years at least prior to that. So uh, it's been a franchise through that string in the North East for uh, over 40 years. Um, we are um, obviously, as uh, Russell just said, very similarly the club, foundation, and now arena as well. Uh, across the three, we have approximately 90 full and part-time staff now. Uh, significant increase over the last last year and a half from what was historically the uh, the club and the outreach work of the foundation. Uh, we um, obviously the arena and uh, a huge learning curve 
Um, definitely, absolutely what the sport needs uh, and the way forward for all the clubs in our league. And I'll hand over to Vince. Hi, I'm Vince McCauley. I'm the Director of Basketball and Head Coach at the London Lions basketball team based at the Copper Box Arena, an Olympic legacy venue at the Olympic Park in Stratford. I've been involved in basketball for many years as a player, coach, manager in every aspect. I took over fully my own team in 1992, entering the BBL with the uh, Hemel Royals at the time, becoming the Milton Keynes Lions. And in 2012, August, right after the Olympics, we moved to London to try and uh, renew the desire for basketball at the highest level uh, in the vacuum that was in London. Um, we have 10 full-time staff, not including players. Uh, we're very much uh, a, a limited company and a foundation. This foundation conducts all our community activity, whether that be a grassroots six-year-olds right through to National League basketball, academy programs, the University of East London, and the professional uh, London Lions basketball team. Um, great partnership with the University of East London, which allows us to engage with education as well. So thank you, and I'll pass you on to Richard at Plymouth. Uh, hi, Sam. Thanks for having us on. Uh, Richard Mullard, so uh, director and one of the co-owners of the Plymouth Raiders Basketball Club. Uh, the club was started in 1983 by a group of founding directors, my father being one of them. Um, so I was almost born into this club. I think I was six years old when it first started. So, yeah, been in it a fair old while. Uh, in terms of operationally, we, we have the limited company that, that operates as sort of professional arm of the club and, and like others, <coughs> a, a foundation, uh, full-blown charity. Um, we have seven members of staff that, that operate uh, both. Uh, and again, like Vince says, we, uh, we we work very closely with Plymouth Marjon University, where we're based. Our offices are based there, and uh, we train there full time. But we're, for the last three years, we've been de developing a new program there too. So, um, home court, we play at the the Plymouth Pavilions, which uh, we we get pretty much just for game days, uh, uh, and that's it really. So, um, yeah, and I'll hand on to Yuri. Last but not least, Yuri. Thank you, guys. Um, so my name's Yuri Matishan. I'm chairman of the B. Braun Sheffield Sharks. Um, I think I can safely say that I was the founder of the club back in 1991 when I moved to the city of Sheffield. But um, we were then the Sheffield Forgers playing in the National Basketball League. Came across Thanks, Paul mate. Blake playing for Sedgefield in that in those heady years. <laughs> so we developed developed from NBL Division Three, moved up the ranks. And in 1994, we moved into the BBL and we've been in the BBL since 1994. <clears throat> and we've been the, the same consistent people and owners um, over that period of time. Um, we actually have a small team of five staff. There are a number of us who are also in um, a, a sister company called a uh, major events company called MLS. So we actually have the Sharks hosted inside our business. Um, though they're a separate company and we have common directors adding a lot of experience and expertise to the Sharks. Um, and we are playing in venues in Sheffield. We've moved from Ponce Forge to the Sheffield Arena to the Institute of Sport and now back to Ponce Forge. What our key aim is, is to build our own arena. And that's a particular focus of our now of our work. And we're ever getting closer to that um, building of the arena. We have five junior teams. Um, we, we have no academy as such, but it's our ambition to have an academy as soon as we can build the arena and continue the work over the last 30 years. Excellent. Thanks, guys. So uh, it's clear to me, kind of hearing the, the overview from, from all of you, that um, there seems to be two strings, at least to every every franchise. You've got the professional team and then you've got the, the sort of foundation slash community aspect. Um, can we start with maybe Rich sort of explaining, uh, obviously you can speak about your specific situation, but if possible, bring in sort of the wider context of the league, the general structure of a BBL team, like how it works, the sort of the two strands of, of your professional stuff and then your, your community stuff um, and anything else that I'm missing in that and kind of, yeah, I guess how that uh, puts together the entire, the entire club. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the reason I think most of us have foundations is that uh, it, it's very difficult to apply for grant funding um, if you're a professional club. So one of the reasons that we, we have 
um, uh, these foundations, to, whether they be charities or CIC, when it comes to Plymouth, we, we went for a full-blown charity, for example, um, is that we can do a lot of good in the community um, and make use of a lot of funding that's, um, that's out there at the moment. Um, in terms of what we do in, in the community, we uh, so I only took over the club three years ago and we actually had very little uh, basketball actually being played competitively across the city. We had a very good Raiders development program, which was a, a regional and national league program. But actually, we didn't have kids playing against each other in the city. So it was, that was a real bugbear of mine. Um, so uh, year before last, we just bit the bullet. We rented space all over the city. We set up... Um, we set up some satellite clubs, uh, a bit like uh, Paul has done in, in Newcastle. Uh, and now we have uh, seven satellite clubs all over the city where kids can essentially just come out their door and walk a few roads away and, and play some basketball. So that was a real key focus for me. And, and in the last couple of years, that's gone from being under 12s up to under 14s. Next year, we'll be looking at some under 16s. And We've gone from having 120 kids playing in just the development program uh, at National and Regional League to next year will be over 500, um, to give you an example. So certainly without that foundation, we wouldn't have been able to focus on that. We got a little bit of funding to help start it. Other than that, it was uh, essentially self-funded by by me um, to get it off off the ground because it's it's a particular passion of mine. But um yeah, I think it, it's it's a vehicle that works very well. I know I took a lot of advice from Russell and Paul as to to how best to set it up. Those guys have been running those um, that cooperation for for many years between the clubs, uh, and I know they probably have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah. So, Paul, when you, when you talk about the interplay between uh, the community side of things and the professional side of things, are they completely separate entities or, you know, are you able to spread resource across the two? Like what is the interplay between the two? And I guess I'm assuming the finances are, are completely separate across the two different organizations. Yeah. So first point, finances are completely separate. So the um, Newcastle Eagles basketball is uh, a limited company and uh, two clubs operate out of that for me at the moment. That's the BBL team and the WBBL team. And that's it. Everything else we do is in the foundation. So uh, a little like what Richard said there, if I explained our <coughs> um, bottom up as quickly as I can, uh, we start at the very bottom with, with primary school programs and we work with over 100 primary schools. Those in a variety of programs you'd have heard about Hoops for Health, um, that's, our, that's our key program. Those primary schools then feed into what we call our club development model. Uh, we started 20 years ago by setting up a junior club uh, in, in Tyne and Weir in the East End of Newcastle, purely because there weren't any junior clubs playing at participation level. In fact, at the time, there weren't any junior clubs playing National League either in our, in our um, immediate area. Uh, but we want to start at a participation level. So set the first club up, fast forward 20 years, there are 35 now. Um, and the primary schools program points directly into those club sites. So you get a one-off, effectively one-off hit six week to 10 week program in the primary school. If you want to keep playing for the rest of your life, uh, you start at that club at, at, at now under eights. Uh, we're down as far as under eights. The club sites then feed into our Central Venue League. The Central, the Central Venue League operates out of the um, venue on a, on a Saturday and a Sunday. All games played in the Central Venue. No, no teams playing home and away. They all come to the venue. Uh, just prior to COVID, we had hit 90 teams playing every Saturday and pretty much all of Sunday in our venue week in, week out. So over 900 players from the 35 club sites. That doesn't mean we only have 900 players. Not all kids that are attending the clubs want to play competitively. Some of them just want to turn up and train on a Tuesday night. Um, and maybe two years down the line, when, when they reach under 14s or even under 16s, might want to get a bit more serious. So, so it's almost a, um, a bridge between uh, turn up and play and get competitive. Um, so a massive playing base off the back of the primary school programme. We do a bit of secondary school work as well, but really we're, we're about transitioning from primary straight into clubs and not worrying too much about whether secondary schools are engaged in basketball or not. Because as we all know, 
nationwide, that's a that's a very very undulating story. Um, you get a different picture every second you go to as to what the level of interest in uh, how PE teacher level is these days in basketball. Very very different to the 80s. Maybe we'll come back to that later. Um, so we move from there into the academy. Uh, we run six national league teams. Uh, and the trials to get into those teams come from the Central Venue League. Every April, you can trial from out of the Central Venue League programme to try and uh, move up a notch to the, the National League programme. Uh, moving up from there, we have further ed relationships with Newcastle College, Time Met College, Gateshead College, Dice Academy, uh, links all three of them up with the club. Uh, we have an under 23s. Uh, men's team that plays in Division 3, currently second place as uh, the season finished. WBBL team, BBL team, uh, and that's the full pyramid. But as I said at the start, everything outside of the WBBL and BBL team is run from the foundation. Great. And then, Yuri, when you're talking about um, sort of the overall financials, when we're comparing the community programme to the, the professional club, what percentage, when we're talking about the percentage split, uh, you know, when we're talking about revenues of the of the sort of the community interest company or foundation and then the revenues of the professional club, how do they compare? In in Sheffield, I think I think historically we may have been different in the way we set up, but roughly speaking, 50-50 for us. We have a community interest company and our sponsorship uh, drivers are the community and not actually the professional basketball playing. So our two big brands, and I'm not here to give them a name check, are two major health companies. And the prior and prior to that was another major health brand. So B. Braun Medical and Canon Medical are interested in what we do in terms of health and well-being, physical activity, working with young people. And that is as important uh, off the court as it is what we do on the court. So we have a study support centre which has been operated now since uh, 1999 opened by the Minister for, for Sport then. And we've been operating a study support centre working with um, children at risk of exclusion, children who are excluded, <coughs> etc. And And that has driven our programme in the community more, I wouldn't say more than, but as much as driving basketball participation. Um, and so we have junior programmes and we have had the under 23 teams and the under 19 teams and um, and so on but we actually have a huge community program in terms of education where the sport of basketball is working in the most underprivileged areas of our region and that has been a great fillet and part of our brand and I think it's part of the brand of all our clubs actually in basketball per se so we financially are split on the community interest side as much as the professional side of playing 50 50 and uh, it's quite an interesting way that you unfold differently um across the across the league vince do you think that you could run a professional club without the community foundation side of things could it be a standalone could the professional club be a standalone entity that is profitable um without the interest and the reach that a foundation or a community program generates um that's an interesting question um i don't think anybody does that the question is, do I think you could do? I think you could do, um, but I think you'd have to be talking at higher levels of investment and higher levels of operation. Um, and this is interesting. My experience is, is opposites uh, on two fronts. Um, Milton Keynes, where I ran a professional team for 13 years, and London, where I'm currently running one in its eighth season. Um, and in, in the situation was, in going to Milton Keynes in 1997, there was no basketball. So we built a community basketball program around 16 satellite clubs that grew up into a, um, a professional team based at an arena um, on the basis that everybody had to care and, 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 and be part of that community. And that was very successful because it was a, a small city of about just under 300,000 people. You could get from one end to the other in less than 15 minutes. So you could actually engage everyone you needed. But most importantly, all the businesses in that area had staff and family who engaged in school and consequently engaged with us. So that was an interesting model that worked. And the split there, not necessarily that you've asked, but in terms of, let's say, sponsorship, ticket sales and community. So in Milton Keynes, the split between sponsorship and ticket sales was probably 
70% sponsorship and 30% ticket sales. Now, flip that to London in 2012. I'm coming into London. So you come into London as a new team and you say, right, should we do the same thing? Should we start from the ground and build 16 communities? Well, you can't do that because London already has a rich heritage of basketball. So now you're saying, do we just run a professional team and not be involved in the community? Obviously, our ethos doesn't allow that in any case. Um, but what you, we chose to do there was actually partner with people rather than create it yourself and then grow. It means you can spend a bit more time and focus on the on the professional end of the, of the team, of the club. Um, but, but to answer your question, can it run and can it be successful? I think you'd have to be talking to the next level uh, of, of operations. And I think whatever people's next level means. So in my opinion, you've got the BBL at one level. You've got... Um, sort of mid to competitive European teams that have oodles of history. And then you're talking about the big boy European teams with millions of pounds. Then you talk about a G League team. Then you talk about an NBA team. That's kind of how I see it. So could you take a G League team and put it in Birmingham and not engage in the community? I mean, why would you do it? But could you? Yes, you could. And you could sell it like you might sell the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Russ, like... You obviously uh, jumped in on Instagram the other day when I put up that, that clip from uh, Sky Sports from 1997 when there was a whole discussion about developing British talent and stuff. Talking to all of you guys now, it's, it's quite clear that um, the BBL clubs do a lot of stuff in the community. They do provide opportunities for, for younger players to play basketball um, and actually probably have the widest reaching uh, community programs of any um, clubs in the country. Two two questions, I guess, is, is one... Why does the BBL get a bad rep when it's talking when we're talking about uh, sort of British youth development and providing opportunities for for younger British players? And two, even though there is this obviously huge groundswell of of community programs that are being provided, why are we not seeing more of these young players at the age of seventeen, eighteen, nineteen play in the BBL and get minutes? Well, I'll answer the first question first, and I think uh, obviously I want to touch upon um, I suppose the reason. Um, the, the perceptional side, but I think the reason why we do so much community work and we're, and we're trying to grow that base is because the, the culture of the sport in this country um, is very different to a, um, a football and, uh, and a rugby and a cricket where they have clubs at every, every single corner you walk around. Um, and I think it's so important for us to build the participation at the bottom um, and give players opportunity to play, to be inspired, to, to hopefully be a Leicester Riders player one day. Um, and that's a, I just wanted to touch upon that because that's one of the important things. The reason we have the foundation is is, is to inspire that. Uh, I, I use that term, inspire the generation to to play the game. And I think the the perceptional side of stuff comes back from many years ago when there was um, a lot of money in the in the sport of London Towers days, Manchester Giants days, when there was huge marketing done, huge arenas and that sort of stuff. But they actually didn't do much community work. They didn't have much uh, substance underneath them. Um, and I think that that is. Um, was a big thing that we've changed our whole model in the last uh, 15 years at most BBL clubs. Actually, we wanted to create sustainable clubs, sustainable clubs that have um, grassroots programs, that have pathways and opportunities for young British players. And I think some older people that were involved in the sport maybe before or saw, saw um, team, uh, games on Sky Sports and TV and, and Channel 4 and stuff like that saw the sport as one thing. Um, and I think we're just, uh, I've got to keep sending that message out and updating people um, on what we're doing. Obviously, we do an awful lot in our own areas. So we do an awful lot in Leicestershire, for example. Um, and we're doing more now in the East Midlands and stuff as well. Um, but I think that there is other places in the country that there isn't a BBL club and there isn't much activity going on. So they're probably saying, well, what is the BBL doing in our area? Um, but probably, I think if you ask the majority of people within Leicestershire and the, uh, that they'll know that, that they can go and play basketball with the riders, whether it's through the grassroots programs at a satellite club, junior national league, um, academy programs, uh, university programs. And I think that, that as we get that message out and then opportunities change, um, like I, 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 even some of our players, we've got to be better at educating our own players um, about opportunities. Um, I think we, we sent 19 players to the States, boys and girls last year. Um, and, um, and, and that's right for some players. It's not right for everybody. If you can find the right situations, uh, it's great for them. But also, we're very lucky to have uh, full scholarships uh, and scholarship offers uh, available here at Loughborough, uh, where you can actually play professionally. And we've seen the likes of Jamel Anderson, Connor Washington, Josh Ward-Hibbert, Levi Null, 
these players that have come through studying at Loughborough University, coming through, playing four years of professional whilst they're studying um, and, uh, and being very successful. Uh, obviously, especially you see sort of Connor and Jamel, Connor, uh, Jamel on the ed- edge of the GB senior men's team. Connor uh, has now broken in as one of the, the GB senior men's players. Um, and they didn't go to America and they didn't go that route. Um, so there is huge opportunity, but it is spreading that word. And um, I think sometimes we're so busy doing it um, and making things happen um, on the ground that maybe we don't shout about it enough and market it enough. And I think that's that's one of the things that I've thought a lot about over the last uh, eight weeks of lockdown, of how, how we change that perception and, and, and what more messages can we get out there. Paul, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I did. I just Can I just come back on to um, Vince's G Lee comment there before, which... Yep. ties up a little with, with what Russell said. Um, late 90s BBL was G League. <laughs> uh, Newcastle Eagles was, was G League BBL, playing in a big arena where I worked very, very hard to try and pack 5,000 people in as many times as I possibly could. Uh, and if I ever reached 10,000 on the gate receipt for a 5,000 crowd, I was jumping up and down. Uh, it would probably be five thousand pound gate receipt for a five thousand crowd, and the uh, and the higher rate for the arena was six thousand pounds, and we didn't get any secondary spend. So it looked great. We were all investing a lot of time, energy, and effort to profile the sport at a different level, and we did it as long and as hard and as far as we could. And our owners at the time lost significant amounts of money in trying to make it work. Reality was, I was bussing in a thousand different people every game. They weren't coming back. And the reason why they weren't coming back is they knew no more about basketball than they knew about <coughs> chess or yeah. tennis or badminton. We needed to build an intelligent audience, uh, a, a basketball savvy market in this region that didn't exist. It exists now. Paul, can I just add to that? Sorry to jump in, Sam. Um, Obviously, uh, we spent three, four seasons in the Sheffield Arena doing exactly the same, playing in those, uh, as you call, G League days, you know. And uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental biggest transformational thing that is happening in the sport is the the arenas that have been built for basketball at its heart. I'm not saying they're purely for basketball, but it's at its heart at Leicester, in Newcastle. Um, and uh, then Bristol are coming on board. Worcester University have created a basketball centre, if that's for want of a better word. And if I knew then what I know now, I'd have spent 15 years building an arena and creating an infrastructure for the game because we have just spent hours in giving money to third parties. To the arena hire, I left the arena when it got to £9,000 a game. And then on top of that, we were paying for for everything else around that infrastructure and all the secondary income was going to the third party. So we worked our socks off in this glamour phase of the game um, to try and satisfy and edify Sky and others. But we didn't help ourselves and we were paying significant salaries to bring G League people in of standard of that quality. But equally... We have now got to a point, I believe, in the last year or two where we've got a highly competitive league. We have got good players in the league and we're sustainable. So we may drop a club every few years because it is a a difficult business, but we're more sustainable now than we've ever been for many, many years. Then people would come and go. All the big owners came and went, came and went. Right now, over the last decade, we've probably been the most sustainable, affordable, incremental league than we've ever been. And what we're trying to do is transform ourselves. And the arenas is how we're transforming ourselves. Awesome. So I don't want to. There's loads of stuff. There's so much stuff to go into. Um, But quickly, (laughs) going back to the the original question I posed to Russ uh, is about um, why are we not seeing the top junior talent? playing minutes in the bbl uh, before they go to the states so uh i, I like one of the things that I, I actually listened to a podcast with you vince the other day and you were asked the question um if you were able to start, build your franchise around any any young player for the next 10 years or, or whatever it is you you mentioned uh, cam hildriff and, and kane henry i think i think the other one was you know 
obviously Cam's got another another year in the UK um, before if he does depart, he departs. Has there been any conversations where you know you've tried to approach him and said, okay, look, we want to sign you to a multi-year deal, kind of look at the European model, sign it, sign a junior player to a to a to a, to a contract, um, get him, bringing him in, and, and sort of try and then develop that talent, and then potentially get a return on that investment if he was to then sign, you know, elsewhere in Europe with a buyout or whatever else. Like, why in England do we not approach it like that? Have we not been approaching it like that? And kind of <laughs> where do we sit when it comes to actually really investing in top junior uh, British talent? Well, I mean, I, I was I'd try and not be as too personal because, yes, of course, we spoke to Cameron Hildreth and, of course, we'd like to have Cameron Hildreth play for us in the BBL uh, next season, just as we had Jordan Spencer at 16 play for us in the BBL. I, I think, you know, we do that as, as a group. I certainly do that a lot. I play a lot of young, young British talent. I mean, don't forget Drew Spinks played in the BBL at 16 for me. Um, Russell Levinson's brother played in the BBL at 16 for me. So that's not a new thing. Um, it's interesting. In the last three years, I have offered four British players aged um, uh, 18, thereabouts, um, very, very comprehensive offers, better than half of my team. And all of them have turned it down. Um, I think we've got an, a unique situation here. Um, two things I would say. The first thing is, can you? we're talking about the general community, the general basketball community out there and how they perceive the BBL, how they perceive what we do. If I went to the press tomorrow and said, um, I want to sign a British player to a six-year contract um, starting at between 15 and 20,000 pound a year and he'd have a buyout clause and he should stay with us and blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure what kind of reaction I would get from the general public. You might think that's a great idea because actually that is a great idea. I believe... 90% of the kids who are going to college in the States are wasting their time. That's mm -hmm. what I honestly believe. Um, um, but I think the perception that, oh, what are they trying to do at London? They're trying to stifle this guy. They're trying to do this. We're never trying to do that. Whereas if a 14-year-old guy from Leicester, as has happened, goes and signs with a team in Europe on a six-year contract and disappears into the ether, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so, so that's the first part. The, the, the second part, I believe, is we're competing against an image of what going to America to play basketball looks like. Mm, yeah. OK, uh, when I was uh, when I was 19, I had a scholarship offer to go to UCLA and I had a scholarship offer to go to uh, a college in Russia. Would you believe now? I wasn't motivated by basketball at the age of 19. I was motivated by trying to become a filmmaker. There are the three best film schools in the world, are UCLA, the Russian Institute and the London International Film School. And I stayed in London. So, but now I can imagine how the young basketball player think, oh, a scholarship to go to UCLA, let me go. What for? You know, okay, at that time and where we are in terms of the limitations of, of, of colleges in the States at that time, maybe that would have been a great opportunity, great school, great everything. But you look at where our youngsters are going. I've got so many young, I mean, we play, obviously not this summer, but all these summer events that used to happen your event at Hoops Fix, Midnight Madness, uh, the various things that, we, that we've done in London, oodles of talent. And what are, you, what are you doing? You know, why don't you come and join with us? You know, we'll give you a scholarship to go to University of East London. You'll play with the BBL men every day. You represent and we'll work with you to get, to get through. And the answer is, oh, no, I'm going to the States, coach. Where, where are you going? Oh, I'm not sure. It's some community college in the middle of Nebraska. <laughs> what for? Indeed. Indeed. You know, it, it, it just makes no sense. And they'll come back worse than when they left because they don't understand the makeup of what's happening on that end in terms of the coach's situation over there, um, what he's trying to do in terms of championships and games, who else he's got in that area, the AAU team that, that, that are affecting what's going on. They, they, have, they can't even think about that. You know? So this is a real challenge for us because, I mean, I mean not, that's not to say that there's so many kids at the age of 18 that should be playing on a BBL team because a lot of them are not necessarily good enough. But if they start at that age and then start to work through, mm. I mean, my first question is when I said to the kid, you know, oh, why do you come and join? Oh, no, I'm going to the States. Why are you going to the States? Oh, well. Um, um, uh, it's an experience. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. the, whereas really, you should be looking at, if you want to be a professional basketball player, you should be saying, that's your job. So if I was a chef, and I said, oh, I'm going to go and work for Gordon Ramsay, and someone says, why are you going to work for Gordon Ramsay? Well, I'm going to start in the kitchen washing the dishes, and I'm going to move to slicing the onions, and I'm going to move to this, and, I, and then in seven mm -hmm. years' time, I'm going to be doing this. Well, why aren't you doing that with basketball? Because you easily could be. 
Easily it could be. But, you know, it, it's a perception, as Russell said earlier, and, and we've got to look and manage that perception. But you can look at all the teams and try and figure the guys who you think are trying to make a way as players. You know, we've already mentioned Jamal uh, at, at Leicester and guys like that. And we've got guys in, in, uh, in London. I mean, Jordan Spencer is a perfect example, a more than serviceable, very championship winning BBL player who at 16, 17 was starting on a BBL team that made the playoffs. And at the end of that season, he's like, yeah, coach, they give me the offer. And I'm like, okay, let me just ask you one question. Do you really want to go? And he said, yes, I do. Well, fine. You know, and then he came back five years later, having redshirted one year, and played with us and started on a championship winning team. Well, where could he have been had he had five years playing with a BBL team before that? Where could he have been? It'd been incredible. But that's the situation. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in from, from our perspective as well. Because uh, we, we caught wind very early, three years ago, when we sort of took the club back on, that kids were just, exactly as everyone said, kids are just being encouraged by uh, whoever, friends, family. Unfortunately, a lot of academies are also suggesting their kids go to programs. And I've seen, I've seen kids in, uh, coming out of various academies throughout the country who have been told to go and play in Italy Division 4 where they're going to go there to a team they've never heard of. They don't speak the language, but to them, they've, they've made it. They're playing professionally in Italy um, for a team that's probably the equivalent of Div 2, Div 3 over here. It, it, it makes no sense. Why are they doing it? Because the academy can then say, well, I'll tell you what, we've sent 40 kids now uh, to this program and this program and this program. And I've, I've spoken to academy uh, people who run big academies and they've said, yeah, we've been guilty of that. I'll be honest. So what we've looked to do at Marjon is um, set up. We're, we're not lying to anyone. We're not saying come here because we've got scholarships. We certainly don't at the moment. Um, but what we do have is a fantastic education program. Uh, a university that's focused on sport, a great basketball program in the city. And in the last few years, we've had Denzi Ubiaro, who's about to go into his fourth year. He went to the States, hated it. Um, we've got Josh Palmer, who's played with us for the last two years. He went to the States, hated it. Um, we've got about 15 kids in our program who are paying students, I might add, but they come to Marjon because of the basketball enrichment and because they love basketball. It's, it's not necessarily about um, coming and playing BBL, but we've got Isaiah Walker, um, Welsh international now, who's played minutes in the BBL. Um, uh, Tyler Okiki, who's played big minutes in the BBL. These guys have all had that dream of, well, I, you know, if I've got to be better, I've got to go and play for a junior college somewhere. It doesn't always work like that. And unfortunately, I have seen a lot of instances where academies are just sending kids to the States for the hell of it. But would, would I want to stop Cameron Hildreth going to the States? God, no, because th that's probably the best place for him for the next few years. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was going to I was going to say that, like, I feel like we're, we're you know, maybe there's two types of player here. There's because at the moment it seems very much like the accepted route is that all kids want to go to the States. Right. But it's actually maybe the kids that are going to that random college in the middle of nowhere, you know, compared to someone that's going to go to a four year division one school like the, you know, I've been to the States. I've visited British players at certain uh, colleges and just level of provision, what they're provided both on and off the court is unbelievable like uh, mm. at certain schools obviously so you know do you think that it's fair to say that maybe we're talking about maybe the mid-tier ones not the guys that have got the best the guys or girls that have got the best options when you know someone like Holly Winterburn who's got an option at Oregon for example is very different to you know someone going to the middle of middle of nowhere do you think that's fair to say that there's a division in the two players Paul? Yeah obviously we had a, uh, a player that's come up through our program the last several years Tosan who um I think he was number five on the Den camp last year, GB under 20, um, you know, um, huge upside, 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, um, we were desperate, desperate to retain him, have him go to Newcastle University. He's a, um, you know, very, very intelligent kid. Um, but he, he got an offer from Harvard. Uh, and, and, and it's not just the experience and the fact that... To Princeton, I think, him. right? Didn't he go to Princeton? Uh, sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, do you want to start that again? Yeah, no, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, Sorry, he's at. Yeah, he's at Princeton. Um, scholarship uh, cost is is off the charts. 
and it's an education thing for him as well as experience. Of course, of course. Level. So, do I think Tosan will find his way back to Eagles in four years' time? I I think it's doubtful. I think um, if he continues with his basketball trajectory, he's had a good first year. Um, you know, an agent will sign him, and uh, an agent will try and get him the most money he can possibly get in if he's if he's looking to take a basketball career. He may not even take a basketball career he may get to, um, into the world of work. But um, our, our issue is once, they, uh, once they're out of our system, it becomes all the harder to bring them back. Equally, um, Rich, I, I spoke to Will Neighbours' parents when we were 17. We tried to sign Will at 17, desperately. I was on the phone with his dad for four hours. Uh, let's forget the conversation. We would have loved to have had Will here. Oh, we're looking for young, young people. So it's probably it's, living with you now, Paul, and eating well, you at house and home. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The other thing, the other point with <coughs> young players going to the States and playing for us before they go, we can't pay them because we prejudice their um, their eligibility. Yes. So, that, so you try and explain that to the parents of the kid that, that still has an inkling of wanting to go to the States. So we say, well, you'll lose your eligibility if you become a professional before you go. Oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm. The, it's the, the other side, if I could, the, sorry, Sam. Yeah, go on, Yuri. Also, across Britain, we don't have an equal picture either. It's it, You could have universities that provide you with scholarships. You have universities that don't provide you with scholarships. And it'll be an interesting time now, after this COVID situation, how many universities will still be in existence and have the funds to provide scholarships because that's a huge challenge going forward. So the so in our city, our two universities provide virtually, you know, minimal scholarships. So for us to retain someone at 18 and say, as Paul just said, you either turn professional and go to university, which compromises you for future NCAA recruitment, or um, we can't give you a scholarship that provides you with your, your education, your food, uh, your subsidy, et cetera. So it's it's very simple to just criticise, but to understand the picture is quite hard. Um, and so everybody's got a varied approach that what they can do and deliver. But I, I just reference um, the two conversations which Chris Finch had with our head coach Atiba Lyons on uh, recently on you know on the on a Facebook channel and Fab Flournoy and Atiba talking about where would you progress your basketball career and why and they both said if you can do it domestically it's the best thing they both said it and you need to understand whether you're going over overseas for an experience and an education or you're going to be a basketball player and those are very different things that often are not really drilled down enough to the people that I have experienced in talking to over 30 years there's this idea that they want to go into the States and become a be better basketball player. And despite having talked to them, and not just us, but our coach, there are other people who give them, oh, that's just, you know, that club's telling you that you want to go overseas. It's better. And they go overseas. And we've had young people who have not gone overseas and we've tried to demonstrate it. Ian McKinney, Jason Swain, Adrian Anderson, you know, all young Cawthorn's brother, etc. We've had lots of people. But for some reason, you know, they're sent overseas. So I think we've got opportunities, but there is a, a view about going to the States. And I wouldn't say no, go to the States and get a four year education if that's what you're about and play basketball. Mm -hmm. But professionally, you can develop here just as well. So, uh, I just want, yeah, go on, all, I tried to add a couple of points to that because obviously. <coughs> Uh, we are we are a club that develops that has a big academy at uh, Charmwood College and uh, we're developing a lot of players at the moment. We have sent a lot of players to the States as well. Um, but we've been in the same situation as Vince. Uh, we've offered numerous players that were on the fringes of the BBL team that were either playing or training or playing in that BBL team in their in their sort of 17, 18 age group um, and offering them four year full full ride scholarships, uh, accommodation, being a paid player. Um, but the problem being is, culturally, uh, they have this American dream in their head and they want to go and experience it um, and they want to go and see what it is. But 
one of the things that I would say is we've had a lot of players now that are coming out the other end that um, were BBL level ready players when they left. And similar to what Vince was saying around uh, Jordan is coming back in at the same level. Like they haven't actually improved over them four or five years to where you would hope they would have. And, it, it, and, it, and who knows? Who knows 100%? But if they'd have stayed here, um, uh, I think they could have uh, made it a, a massive more improvement. And with the facilities that clubs have now, with the coaching expertise, the quality education, um, I think on the basketball side and on the education side, here in England, we, we can easily compare. The problem being is the life experience. When we interview every one of our academy players, the number one priority they put on about going to America is the life experience. Mm -hmm. And that is the only thing that we can't in this league um, uh, compare with. And, and I think that, that that will change over time. Um, and I think uh, some players, it's right for them to go to America. Some players, it's not. Um, the biggest thing I always struggle with is 100% agree with uh, Vince is these players that are going to community colleges um, that have less um, professionalism than even our academy at Charmwood College. And they're going there thinking that that's going to be better for them because of the American dream. Um, and when they turn up and they realise actually it wasn't what they thought it was and, and that affects the stuff, um, often uh, it's too late because that opportunity that they had before may have gone here and whatever else as well. And I think that's the other thing that they need to understand is that um, there, there is only a few opportunities within the, every one of the BBL clubs and um, the, it, how we educate them uh, of what's best for them. And, and I think the other thing is change. A lot of kids also like the, the fact of if they've been in Leicester, Loughborough for four, six years or whatever else, actually change is, is what they think is, is the right thing for them. Um, and it is right for some of them, um, but, but it's also right for some of them to stay as well. And we've seen, obviously, a huge amount of success of players now coming out of, um, and that's players that have been on scholarship and also players that have not been on scholarship. We've seen the likes of sort of the Max Richardsons and the Lucian Christophers that have gone into the professional game that may, may not still be ready for BBR level, but have gone and played in Sweden and Denmark and Norway and other countries. Um, uh, but I think in another year or two, but they were players that weren't even on the radar, couldn't even get... Um, possible scholarships before um, or any options, even community colleges and things like that. So um, they end up with a Loughborough University degree and being able to play professionally. I think there is one point, Sam, if I could just jump in a real quick, a short one, to yep. say that by the same token, I think there's still a lot more that we need to be doing in terms of the experience of that player with us. I think there's a lot more we need to be doing around um, th that person's daily life and that person's... Um, persona in the community. I mean, some of the stuff that you did at with the AEABL some couple of years back in highlighting guys and things, I, I think we, we as clubs have a lot more to do in that area to satisfy maybe some of the exposure and, and uh, credibility, small c, for the players themselves, the younger players, to understand that they are in that progressive path as well. And uh, I think just touching upon <clears throat> that, I think that's where the, the Bucks and the University uh, Premier League and, and, and the restructure that obviously Bucks have been looking at as a national league for, for that competition. And, and uh, so that's actually a really high level competition. That gives some of our young British players opportunities to play against lots of DBL players in that league. Um, uh, obviously, there's different comments on that. Should senior DBL players be playing in a Bucks league and all them sorts of things? Don't be wrong. There's all them comments and that sort of stuff. But one thing that is really good and it's really helped some of our, our players. Um, that have come through um, playing against um, Kai Williams and uh, uh, Charles Smith and, and people like that at points, like our young Loughborough guys, that was phenomenal. And that got them ready uh, for the next stages and things. Even, again, Durham, who have 10 Americans, when you go up and play against them, that's a, that's a high level game, a high level competition. But it's really good for our young players to go up against that level of competition. A lot of Division One and Division Two NCAA players. Sam, can okay. I just jump in uh, quickly? Because I don't think anyone yeah, on, has asked with your, yeah. your second question, which was, you know, have clubs thought about offering pre-contracts and, you know, hoping that they'll come back? Um, now, interestingly, I had, a, I had a conversation with with uh, a shooting guard called Thomas Akazili uh, recently, who plays for Bashishir, um, our kind of sister brother club uh, at the moment in Turkey. And he signed uh, a pre-contract with Antwerp, where he would played for many years before going to college went to college, didn't particularly like it, came back. But I must admit, when he told me that at the time, I thought, well, who does that benefit? Because if he signs something with Antwerp, where he's got, to say, a £5,000 buyout clause, then it hamstrings him 
uh, if he come if he goes to college and has three great years, and someone wants to pick him up, um, and and the team sees he's got a buyout clause, they're going to go well. Maybe we'll pass on you then because we don't want to spend five thousand pounds just to get you when you're unproven. So uh, you know, genuine questions to the other guys here. I I don't see what the benefit is for the clubs or potentially players of actually signing that. Well, there is there is just the one benefit there, which is when you do a pre-contract, you have a guaranteed salary when you come back. So let's say we had a player, you signed a young player at age 18, and we said to him, you know, we'll sign you. You've got this educational possibilities, but if you come back, you're, you're guaranteed a salary of, of 25 grand, 30 grand, whatever you decide it is, for, th for the next three years after. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's holding on to. Yeah, fair so enough. If, yeah. So if, you, if the other club doesn't want to pay the 5,000 to take him and better the 20,000 or 25,000, then he stays where he is. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. You know, yeah. Okay, let's let's move the conversation on a little bit because I'm aware of time and and we've been on that that one for a, for a long time. So, um, one thing I did want to talk about was the BBL's relationship with the federations. Uh, you know, you've got the the home nation, uh, Basel England, predominantly, obviously Basel Scotland as well, um, and then the BBF. Uh, this conversation is essentially about player development pathway. You know, that is something that Basel England are directly responsible for, and maybe <clears throat> maybe I'm wrong, but from what I see when they're talking about pathways and stuff, it's very, uh, it doesn't really include BBL clubs. It doesn't seem that it includes BBL clubs when they have meetings about it and they're talking about it. It's very separate. Um, it's working with the ABL academies and, and sort of their, uh, and regional tournaments and, and all that kind of stuff. I guess where, uh, this is a question for Paul, we'll start with, where does the relationship sit with, with Basel England uh, or the BBF and, and the BBL and the BBL clubs? And, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but why do you not think there is a closer relationship with, essentially, you are, your clubs are member, member organizations of, of the federation, right? So uh, why is, why are you not seen as that? Why is it almost seen as a separate thing? Uh, I suppose I, I would, I would treat that slightly differently. We seem to have daily conversations. I think our, um, our relationships are extremely close. Um, certainly for me, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see a day go by where we haven't had a conversation with someone off the, from the BBL board, uh, BBF board or their own countries. Um, to answer your question, we have a license with BBF, so we operate under under uh, the auspices of BBF. We have a um, communicative relationship with, with Basketball England. Um, obviously, you know, we have one Scottish team which would relate to Basketball Scotland. Uh, we have a massive community program, and we we uh, generate a significant membership, and that membership, um, you know, is is a um, a source of funding for for the governing body. And that's that's the relationship, really. I mean, we we do what we can to grow the sport to support the governing bodies. That's uh, we can't really do any more than that. We're in the regions, you know. We're looking after our own our own territories, if you like. There are only eleven of us. We're not a national map of clubs. Uh, we are not the governing body or a governing body in that sense. Um, so we, we really, for me, and I think this is a conversation that's been sort of going around the last couple of weeks amongst the 11 clubs, we've just got to take care of what we're doing in our own areas and make sure that, a little like Vince said at the start there, no, nobody is coming to us saying, you must deliver this, this and this. We are just getting on and doing it anyway. Uh, Sam, I'm, yeah, go on. I'm the out of the guys here. I am one of the two uh, directors nominated from the clubs to sit on the executive board of the BBL. And what I can tell you is that we make significant efforts to talk to all the federations at all times. And I would sometimes argue that we are perhaps the most um, active in that field of, of trying to make sure that we connect with, link with our CNAP basketball um, governance and structure. And I think perhaps some, it's a question for Basketball England if you feel that it's not part of the structure and system that you ask Basketball England, why do you not see BBL more intensively involved in, in those structures if you don't feel that it's there? We try and we work hard. Uh, with um, the other governing bodies, BBF and BE. And what we have always said is a unified sporting structure would be in all our best interests. 
We are, you know, vehemently behind GB men, GB women. Um, we actually fund BBF as well. And we are probably one of the biggest generators of memberships across our 11 clubs for Basketball England. Paul, would you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, by, by membership, uh, our, our club on the current figures is 3% of the national membership. Uh, but that's, you know, we do that because it's an important integral part of our of building a, a basketball economy in this area that ultimately does help to support the BBL and WBBL team. So we're, you know, the, it's a, a, of mutual benefit, should we say, and that's the way it should work. Uh, another great case study recently, obviously we hosted the GB game back in February. A great example of how BBF, BE and the BBL club can work together in harmony to make something work really well and, and came out with a fantastic result in front of the full house on a Monday night, which everybody on this, <laughs> this call will tell you is, is, is not a day to play a, uh, a professional basketball event or actually most other sports outside of um, football. Touch point there, so let's just go into that quickly. Uh, selling tickets, you know, how hard is it to uh, sell tickets to live basketball games, you know, uh, over the course of a season? Um, when you're talking about revenues that are coming into the club, how big of a percentage of it um, is coming from uh, gate receipts? And I guess we could tie into all of that the impact that COVID has had by sort of, you know, cutting the number of home games that a number of franchises are having and what that means to your revenues. Um, Vince, do you want to jump on that one to begin with? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I did allude earlier on to the fact that uh, I think in Milton Keynes, uh, sponsorship was circa 70% versus 30% tickets. In in London, when we started, it was actually the other way around. 70% um, 70 per, 70 uh, ticket income um, and 30% sponsorship. That has changed slightly now. Our sponsorship has picked up, so that that's improved. Um, but the question being around selling tickets, I mean, um, we have a, a huge venue to try to fill. Um, so you have to try different different methods. You have to try different combinations. You have to have different markets. I guess it's maybe slightly different in London compared to some of the other guys because um, the, the, the nature of our city. Um, the Copper Box is a destination venue. So people come to the Copper Box just to come to the park. So we have probably 50% of our audience come once. Um, they just come because I'm in London, I'm coming to a game, or I'm going to the Copper Box for this event, I'm going to have a meal at Westfield and go and do this, that, and the other. So, so we know that that's the case. So we have to make sure that we, we somehow stay in contact with that kind of crowd, that they find us. Someone arrives in, in, in Stratford or East London or, 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 or Central London for a week or for the weekend, and what shall I do, that we're one of those options. Um, in our case, we do a, a significant sum of advertising, um, we have 29 giant screens across London from Westfield in the West to Westfield in the East. Uh, and we do a great job of, of putting images and detail out there. We have video going out there. We trialed uh, play of the day going out there after every game. Um, so we have that presence there. But then you've still got to get down to the hand-to-hand -hand combat. You, you know, you've got to have your database. We have a database of about 12,500 people. We try to communicate with them on a fortnightly basis, maybe, maybe more than that, depending on games. Um, and then you have those people that you actually touch and, 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 and engage with, whether that be through your community programs, through your partners, uh, through your immediate community area, and, and try and press that as well. Um, having said that, most recently, I had a, 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 most, a, a visit with the guys in, at the Long Island Nets around their department for selling tickets in the G League, which you know, we understand is, is, is obviously at a lower level in terms of uh, um, effectiveness to say the NBA, but maybe you could argue is maybe where we need to be or, or slightly higher than us. But, you know, in a typical G League team, they have a staff of about seven focused on tickets and a staff of about seven focused on corporate tickets. So that's 14 people trying to sell a game for your Saturday. That's nothing to do with the hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's just the engagement on actual tickets on the phone, on online, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think when you look at the back office of, of any BBL teams, you've got to say that's an area that we've got to look at. That's an area we've got to try and improve in as much as bringing back a two-time MVP like Justin Robinson on the floor. Where's our two-time MVP in a back office that's going to deliver £100,000 worth of ticket sales per person? Um, that's something we're very mindful of in London and something that we're really, really trying to concentrate on. 
can we talk about average attendances uh, around the league? Like, um, do we have? Does anyone have the number across the entire league of what average attendances are week in week out? I mean, assuming you probably know for all your clubs, but um, you know, what are the average attendances that we see? Does anyone anyone want to volunteer themselves, or should I just fire it at someone, Russ? Yeah, um, I can talk about Leicester. Um, so our, our facility holds around about 2,400, and we're, we're averaging around about 18, 1,900 um, a, a game. Uh, I'll give you a bit of a makeup of how we get that. Um, we're about a third um, already for our season ticket base and our sponsorship base. We have 70 commercial partners, and all of them involve some ticketing and some corporate hospitality. Um, and then we have about a third of the sort of general sale tickets uh, that we sell uh, via, obviously, um, our normal and our, our, our main uh, outlets to market, which is social media, really, to be honest with you. Um, and then our other third is really, for, for us to be completely sold out, is group bookings. And the difference between us being sold out and not being sold out is the number of group bookings. And when Vince talks about having the right people in the back office and that sort of stuff, that's, that's what that comes down to, is if you have good people in the back office selling them group bookings um, for us if we had the right people all the time doing that we'd be sold out every single game because we have the two thirds already there it's, it's the last third of that group bookings and then what we then look to try and do is create them group bookings into the once or twice a year person that comes into the second third then hopefully our thing is when in, the, in that second third of the general spectator if they come to a game on average, three times in one season, we can then convert them into a season ticket holder. So that's our sort of conversion rate from groups into general ticket sales into a season ticket holder. Um, and, and for us, uh, it's, it, it, it's growing all of that. And we've done lots of different group initiatives. Um, so some of them are uh, just general corporate group initiatives or some of them are community ones where we're bringing in groups where they're doing an hour and a half coaching before a game. Um, they get some food and they stay and watch the game. We, uh, We've done them for many, many years, actually, starting all the way back when we're at John Sanford days. That's how we grow our audience through Hoots for Health and Development days originally. Um, and we've not lost that. So it's really important that we keep generating that interest um, and changing that from a, 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 someone coming once to someone coming more than once to hope them into a season ticket holder. And that's how we've grown our season ticket base over the last sort of 10 years. If, if uh, from my understanding, Paul, I'll come to you on this, actually. Uh, if that the 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 superstar um salesperson is going to um be directly responsible for being able to set out the games why is more investment not being put into a sales team by a club like why not for a season instead of spending i don't know extra money on an american they take you take a portion of that money and, and put it towards a full-time sales manager or whatever you want to call it this this only job is to sell tickets for all your home games because surely that's going to make the money back that in the long term is going to put you on on better footing paul Sam, that is the $64,000 question <laughs> for every sports team in this country, not just basketball. And we how are the earth to find uh, successful, proactive sales, ticket sales people. Uh, we, we go to other sports. We have bad experiences. I've particularly had some bad experiences over the, over the past uh, where, where um, I brought commercial salespeople in from other sports felt they could apply what they knew from that sport to this one and it failed miserably so um so ultimately for me uh if i am going to say if i had the investment to put two or three sales staff in that i knew were going to do a great job uh i would do that immediately the, the route i've taken is uh slow and steady to be fair and work closely with staff that have been with us a, a number of years to uh, incrementally grow that ticket base and equally, the relationships with the people that are buying the tickets. Um, because uh, I don't want us to, to repeat the exercise of 1996 to 1999, where uh, some money was lost, and it took five or six years to find our feet again after that experience. You know, we're, we're in this to break even every year, not to lose any money, which unfortunately... Uh, makes it difficult to invest on that on that business model. All that said, um, if I compare my ticket sales uh, the last year of the Sporting Club, Newcastle United Sporting Club, 1998, uh, to this season, we are 10 times the ticket revenue we were when we were putting four and 5,000 people in the venue at Newcastle Arena 
and it looked fantastic on Sky Sports uh, 10 times. Uh, this season, of the last four, it's been a 10% incremental growth. This season, first full year in the arena, albeit unfortunately we didn't get to the full year, uh, with five games left to go in the calendar, we'd reached the same ticket sales as the season before, which is devastating. Um, you know, particularly I haven't been on such an upward curve. To add to that, because we're in our own facility, uh, number one, we retain all of that ticket income and the foundation we see we spend on match nights, which historically would have gone to Northumbria University or Newcastle Arena. So when when you talk about um, the pro the pro club aspect of your entire club, so the, the pro club side of it, uh, this is a question for for you, Rich. What percentage of uh, the professional clubs' revenues are coming from uh, ticket sales, and then di- directly re- related to that, how has what is currently going on with COVID impacted you guys? Um, what does it mean for you in terms of loss of revenues, and I guess the future looking forward as well? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've probably not been impacted as much as um, the likes of, of Ross and Paul because of owning an arena. You know, owning an arena sounds like a great thing until you get a, a government lockdown where no one can use the arena because you've, you've <laughs> still got most of the costs and, uh, and no income. Um, for us, I think we had uh, three home games left. Um, we don't make a huge amount of money on, on games because the cost of our venue is, is so high and we don't get any secondary spend. So um, we're making peanuts on games, really. And there are some games at the start of the, years, the season will make a loss. Uh, and, you know, over the season, we hopefully um, bring in enough money to sort of cover it. But uh, in terms of revenue split, it's around about one third um, comes from uh ticket sales down here in plymouth um we we average around about 1200 a game we've got just under 1500 that we can get in um and we we probably have around about 800 regular 800 to 1000 regular fans um we do get groups on on top of that so last year wolferston's fantastic sponsor of ours brought nearly 300 people to the game they took over the whole of the balcony um, and it happened to be the game that we announced our new partnership with um, with Turkey as well. So it was just an amazing event. Um, but it, it's very hard to sell tickets uh, down down this way, if I'm honest. Like Russ said, we, we rely heavily on social media. Um, the newspapers now prefer to cover just Argyle, um, and that is a, a reach policy across um, the reach newspapers. They cover just a sports team. Um, in a city so if we get anything in the newspaper it's because we've written written it and because they want us to pay for it um, they want us to pay for it as part of a contra deal which you know we're going to be looking closely at next year because I, I fundamentally disagree with it um, so but I think one of the best ways and you know, I, I learned this from from Paul is that if you can build that base of dedicated fans in the city at under 12, you know, we've got, we're going to have next year the best part of six, um, five, 600 kids playing in the city basketball, which is five times what we had three years ago. They've all got siblings and parents and grandparents and friends. And, you know, we're actually seeing a huge increase in the number of people who are buying tickets from those, uh, from that, that self-built fan base. So it's not just about, getting kids playing in the community but our central venue program in the city is about building our new fan base our new sponsors for the future you know there are kids who are 10 15 years later going to be working for big companies or running big companies who are going to want to get involved and get their staff involved but it's also an opportunity to to train new volunteers and new coaches and new officials and you know it's uh, and that that creates a, a huge market and a huge buzz in the city so that's probably the one thing that we're heavily relying on. And in terms of loss of income, for us, we weren't making a huge amount of money off the games anyway. So it's it's not we, we've lost more income from the likes of um, schools coaching and some of the grant programs, some of the grants that we've we've applied for. We're just not getting now because it's all gone to covid. We had huge plans for, for camps in the summer where we were going to host kids from China and from Turkey. All that revenue's gone now, but that's revenue for for the foundation. So that's that's our biggest revenue loss, rather than it being sort of ticket sales for the limited company. Yuri, I wanted to ask because uh, you said you was on the executive board. The, the actual management structure of of the BBL, um, 
Can you explain to give us an overview of, of exactly how it works? And then when it comes to decisions, um, like, for example, the decisions that you're making at the moment around uh, what's going to happen with the 2019-20 season and then going into next season, the structure of the league and stuff. How are decisions like that made? Um, what is the actual process to get a, uh, a, a final decision across the line about how things are going to move forward? Well, to, to work uh, as a helicopter view initially, um, when we signed a new 10-year license with the British Basketball Federation, we had governance uh, models to follow in order to agree upon that license. And that, at the time, we were being operated by uh, a board which comprised of all the 12 franchises as it was at the time. And that can be very useful in one way, but it also is, is not always the easiest way of operating a business uh, with 12 directors and so on. So the governance model that we had to adopt was that we would have to have an executive board where the independent directors outnumbered the, the club directors. So we moved to a position where we've got five directors, an independent chairman of Sir Rodney Walker, who was the former uh, chair of UK Sport and Sport England, uh, Leicester City Football Club, was chair of Rugby League, etc. So he is our chair. And then we have two independent directors, Edward Lord and um, Simon Brown. Edward Lord is fr was the former chair of swimming. Um, Simon Brown was the former cricketer and um, member of ECB, uh, on the ECB uh, organisation. So there are independent directors. Um, myself and Kevin Routledge from Leicester are the two nominated uh, directors from the rest of the shareholders uh, clubs. So we act as an executive board operating the business from a day-to-day -day perspective with the staff at the centre led by the chief operating officer Andy Webb. And we have about seven full-time employees presently operating the league and working with all the clubs. On, on certain issues, we go back to all the shareholders, which are the clubs, to ask for decisions on key things. Policy, strategy is decided by the clubs at shareholder board level. And then we get on with it on a day-to-day -day basis as executive directors. So the decision about how the season ended was unanimously decided by the clubs. And then that was, um, to, you know, is to be released. Um, to, to, the, to everyone else. So we are actually governed by what can be done by the executive board and what can be done by all the shareholders. So major investors um, coming on board is going to be every club. And so that's a, a change in governance, which we've experienced now for just about 18 months to, to two years. So fair, uh, perhaps two and a half years now. So quite new. And we are responsible to the BBF to satisfy requirements in our license agreement with the BBF and they in turn are responsible and accountable to us for certain things as well. So that, that's how it currently operates in terms of a boring way of how we make our decisions. I think <laughs> as clubs we are meeting every week still. We have our Zoom meetings weekly and the board is meeting weekly and, and information is flowing from one to the other very regularly. Do you think there is real oversight and accountability? Like I, I remember when the, the license came out, um, well, the announcement of the renewal of the license came out in 2017, right? Um, and I mean, we didn't see the specifics of it, but there was various different things that were pointed to um, about certain playing standards in, in terms of the, the court, uh, in terms of uh, financial investments that have got to be made into the player pathway. I think it was 75,000 um, per club. Uh, who, like I'm assuming that, is meant to be the BBF that is meant to hold you guys accountable to doing that. Uh, who at the BBF is meant to be doing that? Are they doing that? Uh, how are, are you clubs actually being held accountable by whether it's the BBF or, or the um, independent sort of uh, executive board? The, the independent directors are, are fully immersed in every decision we make. Um, perhaps, you know, speak to the BBF about whether they feel that we are... Um, producing all the accountable information that they require. We feel that we supply them with all information that we are need, need to supply them with, and we engage with the BBF where and when we can, uh, as regularly as we can. The BBF have no full-time staff. They're um, a group of uh, 
volunteer and home governing body directors chaired by Maurice Watkins. And um, we believe we're adhering to every requirement on the BBF license. So, um, and we pay a license fee to the BBF on an annual basis as well. Cool. The, related to all of this stuff uh, in terms of the structure is, is um, how things sit when it comes to investment. Obviously, Vince, we know the Lions have uh, recently come across some some decent uh, investment. Um, how does that work? Uh, is the club independent of the league in terms of making decisions who the majority shareholders are? Um, when that money is invested, what happens with it in terms of the greater great piece of the entire league um and i think specifically what i'm, what I'm getting at is I was, I was listening to the david lowe podcast on on mvp and one of the things he was saying was that uh one of the potential issues for an investor is the fact that if they're investing um in the league or or franchise maybe you need to clear this up for me is that um there's profit sharing. So they're potentially not going to see the full return of their investment in their own pocket. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I don't know whether you could explain, but how, how does that work? Yeah. Kind of, and, and maybe just give us a brief overview of kind of what, what's happened <laughs> with you guys at, um, at the Lions recently. Sure. I mean, I think uh, there's, a, there's a kind of overview position you need to take um, as an individual, and, and which is kind of around what you want your professional basketball team to be, you know, and, um, and there's a lot of things you can put into that pot. Um, to, to firstly refer to the point that David Lowe made, which you just referred to, to me, um, if anybody is investing into basketball for a profit share, then they may as well go out that side door because that's a completely pointless exercise. Completely pointless. Now, I know David comes from a football background and they're all about hustling money and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't happen in basketball. That's number one. I mean, has there been a profit share? Will there be a profit share? Yeah, there might be a profit share on the operations of the BBL and we may get something or, or not something. But if that's what you're investing for, you're wasting your time for a number of reasons. What is it that you want to achieve as a basketball club? You know, in terms of growing the business, in terms of making it a profitable business, there's, there's, there's lots that go into that. There's a significant investment. We don't have an arena in London. I, I, I mean, the, the investment that Leicester and uh, Newcastle and, and the other arena clubs are putting into their bills and, and managing theirs and selling their, 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 their offerings is, is huge. I mean, I don't know. I, I, we can always ask uh, Paul and Russell in a minute when they expect the arena to turn a profit, but it's going to be a long time. Now, we've talked about some of the issues over here um, in running a team around, around players, around, around tickets, around sales, and so on and so forth. We, we're a long way from looking at ourselves as profitable basketball clubs. If you look at, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, we should be like a League 2, League 1 type um, football club. But even there, you know, so it's a, in, in, out of the Premier League. If you're not in the Premier League, there's, a, there's an 80-12-8 uh, eight, eight split. So that means the championship teams get 80% of all overall sponsorship and income. The League One teams get 12%. The League Two teams get 8%. That's how they're structured. But even those getting um, 8% are making significantly much more money than we are, yet we have more attendances than they do. So what you do, as a, what we've done, or what I've done here in London as a basketball club, is try to say to myself, what is our goal? What is it that we are trying to achieve? And, and I think that if you look at the BBL's mission statement, it says we need to be a respectable league in Europe, regularly competing in European competition and attracting Great Britain basketball players back to the UK. Well, that's what I want to do. So my goal was to be competitive in Europe. Well, different people have different things about what competitive in Europe means. So to the layman, you've got the Euro League at the top. You've got the... Um, the, the old Korach Cup or FIBA Euro Cup at the bottom and the Champions League in the middle. So you can plump for the middle and say you need to be a Champions League team, reasonably competitive in there. That will make you respectable in Europe. You've got to bring Great Britain basketball players back. Well, we've done that across the country in, in terms of London. Obviously, Justin Robinson, obviously, Obi Soko and, and other, you know, bringing up back other players back, not just those guys. Don't forget people like Paul Guid and so on all played in Europe. We brought them back. Um, so to achieve that, you're going to have to raise your game um, and raise your game in any which way. Build an arena is one option. Get significant investment is, is the other option. And in, in my case, that's what I've done. I've gone out 
as I've done over the last few years, continuously trying to raise money for basketball, get the right investment with the right vision, because it has to be married together. You know, if it's about bring your investment and let's go and make some profit, you might as well go and do something else. But from our case, it's about let's raise the level behind the scenes. Let's raise the quality of basketball player on the floor. Let's get out there and be competitive. Because I don't, I, I, I mean, you, you said you, you heard my podcast the other day, that very podcast the other day, I've already said, I don't buy what a lot of people say about what's going on in Europe. A lot of it is fake. So, and I've done a lot of research into that. I've talked to players who've played at the highest level, the mid level, the low level, and I know what's going on in Europe. And we, guys try to hoodwink us into what's really going on. They do have a head start on us. Um, you know, a lot of teams got a million euros to start in the morning. They get the, the, the venue paid for, free of charge, all, all that kind of stuff. And I still think we, with a little bit of the right investment, we can be competitive at that level. But an organisation like the organisation that invested with Seven Seven Partners, right? They're, they're, a, they're an astute investment uh, company. Uh, surely the reason they invest is to get a return on their investment. Like, why are they investing if they're not expecting to see a profit? Okay, so then the last bit missing from that point would be timeline. You know, when you expect to get that investment, uh, sorry, that uh, that return on investment. Um, if I were to ask a, a, a regular mid person in the street who knows a little about basketball, not a lot, and I said you know, where do you think you can make your significant profit from significant investment in basketball? You'd have to be talking about selling out your venue at over 5,000 seats. You've got to be talking about having in excess of 100 sponsors. All that takes time. So it's not a three-year thing or a five-year thing. You've got to be a long-term investor. Our current partners now think that this is a five to 10-year project for them, and they're prepared to wait that long. Okay, makes sense. Um... Okay, in relating to all that topic, particularly close to my heart, media and communications, uh, you know, where do we sit on kind of uh, the club's duty to uh, try and engage with local media and national media? Uh, how difficult is it to engage uh, with, with media? Um, you know, Vince, I don't want to put you on the spot, but obviously we haven't even had an official announcement from the club about this investment yet, I don't think, in, in my inbox. We've heard you talk about it on podcasts, but we actually haven't had a sort of direct communication uh, as it, in terms of a press release or anything like that. So kind of where are we at um, in terms of what you expect from your own franchise uh, to communicate with with both the, the media, but also fans, I suppose, um, and what needs to be done to to improve it? I will fire that one at you, Yuri. Well, um, from our perspective, very recently, and it's just a shame that uh, COVID came along, but we invest. We have invested as a league in a new communications uh, director. Um, we invested in the uh, recruitment process for that. And she was appointed. We took her out of a large corporate and she's, she started on the 31st of January and then boom, um, COVID has hit us. And um, as part of our survival plan as a, as a league we've had to furlough staff and um, so unfortunately Selena is is unable to work for us at the moment so our PR activity is limited at the moment and it's not because we're not aware of all the opportunities that are out there but we have to be careful about what we can and can't do so we've invested in a, a comms director we want to up our game we we agree Sam that we have some fantastic stories to tell people and we've not been doing it as well as we would like because a lot of us regionally, I believe, have got good press. I certainly know in our local media areas of the Yorkshire Post, the Sheffield Telegraph, the Sheffield Star, um, uh, which is JPI Media, we are regular contributors and we are regularly uh, seen in those publications. Um, so I think we... We do quite well. I know in the Leicester Mercury, uh, you know, in the in the Chronicle up in Newcastle and so on. I don't know down in Plymouth, but they have good exposure too. So what we have is this patchwork of a quilt coming together. But we need to tie up nationally and get our profile raised as as a sport, and and that's why we've invested in a communications director to do that for us, and that's our next step. And the proof will be in the pudding. One of my personal bugbears this season has been key motion. Uh, I found it very, very difficult to uh, to watch games. I'd be interested to hear uh, your take as owners of the clubs that 
you know that's your product that is being put on a on a stage like that um i, I believe it was a multi-year deal as well so i, I think that the plan is for it, it's going to be back again um which is disappointing for me personally um but i would yeah be interested to hear kind of what your takes as owners are um what you think about it and whether or not you could potentially see it changing anytime soon or th- you're locked into that contract and that's the way it's going to be moving forward i'll put that at russ yeah, so um, I think the key motion um, software uh, isn't actually in its full working condition. We've only had the single camera. I think there's a lot more the key motion can do, first of all. Um, it is a change for us uh, going into automated uh, technology uh, from having the televideo uh, cameras that we used to have at the games. Um, and I think but for us, it, it, eventually, we're hoping that will be a step forward as it grows and develops. Um, it will never be um, probably at the same quality, but obviously cost effective wise, it makes uh, a lot more sense for our business um, at the moment to be able to provide what we need to provide um, for the current outputs, uh, both online and betting. Um, and I think the, the big game changer for us is, again, and this always gets spoke about, is the TV and broadcast. Uh, for us to, to really be able to put better investment into better quality production, um, we need to be finding the right TV partner and TV broadcast partner that wants to help support uh, British basketball um, and provide British basketball and our league with with the right outputs. Um, I know, Vince, you've got a lot of expertise in this. This is, this is your field as well. So I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, it's frustrating. I mean, it, it is frustrating because, um, it, it, you know, it, it costs in excess of anywhere between 15 and 20,000 pounds to properly produce a broadcast quality game i.e. with seven cameras, replays, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, there are comparisons with Netball, who are on Sky and have a partnership with Sky, but you know, Netball pays for that production. You're talking about circa £400,000 that they pay towards production. And you know, if we had £400,000 as a league, is that the best use of our money to do that, um, rather than continue to fight to try and get a better deal from a broadcaster and maybe or maybe further develop some of these opportunities like key motion into multiple cameras which you can do into graphics which you can do so i reckon this is only a a phase one of potentially eight for key motion in terms of what it can do what we need to do accelerate that and really express that um paul do you think paul do you think we're um anywhere closer to getting a tv deal uh i I did have a conversation with bob hope uh this week that will be going out on the podcast next week and he just said that it's so difficult because football essentially takes uh everything um and it's so hard for any other the sports to get in like kind of where do you think we are as a league in terms of being able to get a regular slot on tv um i think there are excuse me i think there are opportunities out there I think there have always been opportunities out there. The world of television has changed uh, dramatically from our um, our days in the late '90s with Sky Sports. You know, and we've been we've been with Sky Sports on and off, off maybe ten or eleven years of the last twenty, um, and and it's been a different relationship every time. So the opportunities are there. We know what the model is that needs to be put in place to make it work for all parties. Um, uh, and it's uh, even modern day television tends to work on the basis of uh, you have to come with a funded picture essentially if you want the airtime because it's got to work for the TV company alongside uh, the, the, the organizations that are bringing the product. I know there are com- conversations ongoing, um, probably escalated slightly because we're in uh, this period and there's more time to talk. Uh, not over the line, but um, I, I'm I'm relatively hopeful that we uh, we find a position that we would like to get to sooner rather than later. Makes sense. Okay, two two topics to cover before we wrap up. We've got about ten minutes left. Uh, the the big one is the one that is comes up repeatedly is player salaries uh, and financials. So um, <coughs> I'd be interested to know uh, what your playing budgets are, um, how they're decided, and what the average salary of a player on your roster is i will direct that at yuri first <laughs> well the player's salary cap at the moment is is two hundred and fifty thousand pounds so that's the bbl's official line that you can uh, have so you know you can divide 10 12 players into that and you can make an average and that's where you have and then teams approach that differently some will uh 
um, pay, invest in a superstar <coughs> that could absorb significant sums. And others will probably be a lot more uh, balanced across the field. And and we tend to be like that. Uh, we'll we'll we tend to spread it across all the guys. And so, um, you know, you can get players. Um, and I'll talk net versus gross because. Yeah, the the skill of this is how to minimise tax, but not uh, do it illegally. So we so you can get players earning a thousand pounds a month net, but they'll be living free. They'll have a vehicle, and they'll probably have lots of other benefits that you and I don't uh, benefit from. And then at the other end of the scale, there are guys on three thousand, two and a half thousand pounds net playing for the club, um, and that's how we. We operate, and those are the kind of uh, parameters in, in which we operate, and, the, and that's what that's the, the hard facts of the game. Those are the simple things that we can afford um, in this league at the moment. So there, so you can earn and have paid in the past players up at fifty thousand plus per season, um, and they do exist, but they'll have to be very special key franchise players. Um, but if you do that, you then minimise what you can do for the rest of your team. So that's the model within which we work. Um, it's very simple. We're not interested in breaking. We have lived through the boom and bust of salary inflationary spirals. Um, we've employed John Amici in our club. And, you know, we've had ex-NBA players. Um, so we've done it. We've been in and done it all. And what we're trying to do is be financially affordable. Now, if young people on your show or others are looking and questioning, you think, well, that's not a lot of money. At the, at the moment, that's where the game is. Can we, would we like to pay more? Yes. But we've been boom and bust. When we had money in the period where we were receiving money with the NTL deal, we all went boom with salaries and soon went bust. And so we've learned that this is about more than just what you pay salaries. It's about creating an affordable business plan and that is also about having a facility which drives you more than just tickets. Because we've talked about ticket sales, but what's more important is the secondary spend, because that's as much as a ticket sale. And that's the thing that people out there need to understand, that football clubs have, that rugby union clubs have, rugby league clubs have, and we don't have. So we're living off sponsors and a hiring out of a venue. So those are the salaries under which we live. And it's there to protect us as clubs rather than break the bank and soon and find yourself bust after a year or two. Paul, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just <clears throat> just to add to what you're already saying there. <clears throat> it's got to work within a business model and, and uh, uh, business model or investment model, as, as um, Vince alluded to before. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately, that means we've got to generate more money. Um, and we've got to generate more money in a sustainable manner. We weren't doing it in a sustainable manner in the late 90s. We were um, over-egging our marketing budgets to bring people in for one game and one game only because the base wasn't wasn't built. Uh, and, and then giving all, as you already said before, then passing that money over to the, uh, the landlord who, who owned the facility that we were playing in. That doesn't work. So... I see um, my ability as a club to increase the playing budget. And as you already said, it's, it's 250000 at the moment across uh, as, a, as a, a salary cap. But equally, uh, we've had a soft, a soft cap on British players. So it, it can elevate over the two fifty dollars uh, for two British players. Um, ultimately, though, that we can only spend that additional money if we've got it. That means I've got to sell more tickets and sell more sponsorship. Um, and uh, I, I'll never forget the day that that was uh, explained to me. You know, in certain terms, at a, an NBA game at the O2 by Mr. David Stern, very eloquently, what we all need to do is sell more tickets and sell more sponsorship. And, and actually, caveat to that, uh, generate a higher price per ticket to in increase the revenue because we will only have a limited number of seats. We're never going to be in a situation where we have 40,000 seats like a football club may have. 
um, you know, we're a, we're, we're a limited uh, audience uh, event, particularly in this country. So we've just got to generate more income. That's the bottom line. Makes sense. Um, on that note, uh, Yuri said, you know, we have to protect the clubs. And I would counter that with what about the players? And a couple of the questions that we had um, was around player welfare and what's being done for, for players to protect players in, in situations where maybe their contracts aren't honoured or, or whatever it is. Um, Kieran Achara actually jumped in and he said there was recently a duty of care in sport uh, government report that was released uh, with recommendations for player welfare. And he was at one, wanted to know um, whether, like what, what steps are being taken to ensure that player welfare welfare is at the forefront and whether or not anything has changed within the BBL as a result of that report, whether anything's being done about it. Um, I'll shoot that at you, Russ. Well, I think one of the first things on that is actually the majority of the money that we bring into clubs and aspect of stuff goes into investment into players, whether that's salary, support. Um, uh, and, and I think that um, there's certain players uh, that that you continue to support and continue to have relationships with after after playing days and what support you can provide them. So there's a number of players that we've been able to offer great opportunities for as well um, that have come to the end of their careers and have got a master's uh, univer- um, a master's degree at, at Loughborough and stuff like that. So one of the things that we work very hard with as well is looking at after players. Obviously, most, in, in, in most sports, unless you're an NBA player for basketball, you're probably going to have to have a job when you retire at 35, 36. So it's about that duty of care as well as looking after that player, nurturing them through their career, but also supporting them after that career pathway as well and and providing them with information, um, training um, and support uh, of that development afterwards. And and we try to do a lot with that and and provide that support. Um, I I think the, the difficulty you always will have, and I think people have said it before about players' unions and that aspect of stuff, but I think the problem we have at the moment is um, there probably isn't enough money in our sport compared to premiership footballers and what they're making and all that sort of stuff um, to, to put huge investment into more resource to, to administer that and, and provide that opportunity and things like that. I think that's definitely where the sport will need to go in the future. Um, but I think everybody, players-wise, have, has a contract with a club. Um, and like any type of employment contract or player contract, that there's... Uh, things that you have to abide by as the club, uh, as the employer, and the same things the players have to do as well. Um, and if there is disagreement, there's also process to, to deal with them disagreements like any employment. Um, hopefully it never gets to that, but sometimes it does. Um, Would there be any pushback from any of you guys if the players were to unionise? No, not at all. I think... Um... You know, I would encourage that. I've always encouraged that. The league has always encouraged that. Don't forget when we did have a players' union yeah. uh, back in the days of Mark Robinson, we contributed to the funding of that of that um, players' union. Um, I, I think you know n- nothing is perfect, and we're certainly not perfect. But I think what you need to look at, I guess, is have a look at uh, turnover of British players and see if British players are staying longer with clubs, uh, are staying in the league longer, and being around longer, and, and creating something that they want to be part of. And I think that's that's the test to see whether things are, are getting better. And I think they are. If you look around the clubs, you see players staying there much longer, especially British players. Um, I, I mean, like I said about another point earlier on, there's a lot to be done. But what we mustn't do is, as basketball people, and I don't mean just us in the game, I mean all of us that love basketball, not to be overwhelmed by frustration uh, because we're not where we want to be, uh, whether that be on the floor, off the floor, wherever. We're not where we want to be. I think we all accept that. Um, what we have to do is continue to improve on all these areas that we can improve on. Have deeper squads, have full-time professional squads, make sure everybody's training every day, make sure you have medical support, sports therapists at every practice session, at every game. These are things that we are all doing as clubs. I, I, you know, a lot of the clubs have, have those kind of supports in place and we have to continue to improve that for the player. Sam. And, and then, sorry, just on that note, and that's not just for our current players, but that's also for players that have come through our programme. So we'll see every single summer players that, I don't know, whether they're in America or whether they're in playing in Europe, actually coming back here um, uh, and using and still using our facilities and using our support staff. So it's, it's, it's that looking after, especially our British players and our own players, uh, providing them their support and that home um, that's way bigger than even money. It's uh, uh, and that nurturing of, of love and support you can provide and opportunities. Um, and we've done it numerous times, even for players that haven't even played for us, but are from the area. Um, Pharaoh, who was injured last season um, and had knee surgery, um, was using the, using our facilities, our strength and conditioning coach, and our our, our medical team. 
Um, and that's providing them uh, a, a GB international player, the support he needs to be able to get him back and playing for, to go and make his living, um, but also for him to uh, to go and uh, um, play for the, hopefully the national team as well. Is he going to play for Leicester Riders? Maybe one day, um, but at the same time, it's much bigger than that. Yuri, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I mean, and it's great that Kieran's made those points because we have reached out to Kieran as a league. Um, it, it's 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 being done informally at the moment, but we are speaking with him, and we very much respect Kieran Ashara and what he achieved in the game and and the individual he is, and we're very keen to build our relationship with that through Kieran and through perhaps many of the other GB players who are out there and um, may feel frustrated since 2012 the Olympics and how the funding's gone, etc. But um, yeah, we are mindful of the the points that Kieran is making. Just to stick on that topic and, and kind of segue into another one, London City Royals, obviously, you know, not a great situation for the league this year. Um, folded mid-season. You know, you've got an entire roster of players that have now, you know, were under contract and obviously have lost out on that money. Um, you know, there are disputes with players from the season before about their 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 pay packets and not getting paid and, and whatever else. Um, you know, what's the league stance on that? Surely the, you know, the league is run by the clubs. Is there not some type of duty of responsibility from the league to whether it's, I don't know, step in, provide financial support or guidance? Um, my understanding is speaking to players and staff is that there has been very, it's just, it's just died and that's it. And there's been no sort of pickup um, in terms of trying to, I don't know, support the players in, in some type of way. Is there any type of response to that? Anyone want to jump in or should I pick on someone? Well, I can jump in. I mean, I think um, it, it, from a league standpoint, I'll let Yuri tell you. But I mean, I think every club here, I, I mean, Richard mentioned earlier on that he, in, in talking about his community development, he spoke to Russell, he spoke to Paul. We all talk to each other and we all offer support to each other. Um, some of us have been here a long time. Some of us have been here a short time. The owners at the Royals literally arrived on the day, if you like. I mean, I'm sure they went through all the necessary paperwork and everything else they needed to do to establish themselves, which they did. And, and, and they had a, a great vision to bring back a lot of British basketball players. But, you know, I certainly reached out to the owner of the Royals on numerous occasions to try to talk about the fact that they were, you know, slightly lopsided in terms of what they were trying to do. Income was, was practically zero. Sponsorship was zero. Attendance was zero. You didn't need to be a, a genius to see that. You only need to go to the games. Um, it was unsustainable on that basis, but we were kept being reassured. I certainly was getting reassured individually that the person was able to cope with what was happening. But how do you go about stopping someone doing something like that? I'm I'm not really sure. It, you know, when the, when the club was established, it, it paid what it needed to pay. It proved it had funds to run at a certain level, but the, the rate at which it was running was out of control. In terms of support to the players, I've spoken to a number of those players uh, during their time there and after their time there. I've done my best to employ some of the guys that were there previously to try who, who live in London and try and make sure that they're still working. But, you know, I think every now and again, you're going to get a maverick who thinks that, you know, they don't want to go the long route. I mean, Paul said earlier on, he wants to build his program step by step by step. And that's what everybody's trying to show that they're trying to do at the moment. You just can't come in here if you don't have the wherewithal to make it happen. You know, and you certainly can't throw it at it the way, the way they did. Does the situation with the Royals um, not potentially expose a flaw in the process uh, of actually accepting a new franchise into the league and ensuring that due diligence is done to, you know, whether it's a, they've got the actual financials for five years rather than, I don't know what the requirements are at the moment. Like what's the, what, let's say a friend, let's say I come to you guys and say, I want a franchise, you know, what is the process for the league to accept a franchise and kind of maybe what have been the learnings from the Royals that are going to potentially change things moving forward? Paul? Okay. Cool. Um, it might be one better for Yuri. I'm not, not to pass the buck, but, but there's a board no, no, process. I mean, it's, it's absolutely right. And um, it's, a, it's a very good point you make, Sam. It is, uh, we are no longer in the business of accepting anybody and everyone to, to take a franchise just because they want to. Um, the, these are major commercial commitments and we're de determined not to have another boom or bust we we experienced that in the 90s in fact you can go back to murray in murray international and all those great heady days where for five and six years you know it was all wonderful in falkirk or edinburgh wherever and then they've all disappeared including crystal palace what it is um we had a business plan from um, london city royals and 
they didn't stick to their business plan. And we tried to advise them that they weren't sticking to their business plan. And unfortunately, the consequences uh, are all to be seen. We're not pleased with that. We will take stronger now interventions with, with organizations to ensure that we see business plans, that we monitor those business plans more closely, and we will try support more, give more advice if that's uh, possible. But it's important when the key thing that takes a company under like this is often the salaries. And if you pay way above your means, you will go under. And that's a, a key fact. And it's a hard learning curve because when somebody comes in, they have the aspiration of knocking everybody for six, being the best team in the league and knock, you know, winning the title from day one. These things take time. And in London, it's very difficult to develop a franchise successfully. And we've seen that over a number of years um, with other London teams coming and going. And so we've learned uh, we will stay closer to new franchises. Certainly, you know, the investment aspirations of the teams from Turkey. We've spoken with the owners from Turkey. We are speaking with the owners of the London Lions um, and, and obviously uh, Vince is speaking to us all the time. So we're now much more aware of staying on top of these kind of things rather than just saying, yeah, great, you're another franchise owner. Wonderful. Let's just pop in and start a team. It, there's, it's, it's quite a significant investment required. And we, re we require a three year business plan as a minimum. What is the cost of uh, of entering the league? What's what's the, I think the, is the franchise fee around twenty five thousand yeah. a year? Um, is no, that what no. it is? It, it's one hundred and fifty thousand pounds for a franchise, and um, what you what we can do. It, sometimes people pay it from the get go, but often we will take a, a sort of four five year approach to the franchise paying that franchise fee. Um, okay. So it. it uh, it's that it's that kind of approach we take. So it's not prohibitive. Um, certainly, if you're coming into the league and looking to invest four of a million in salaries and the rest of the infrastructure, etc., then there is a fee to entering it. Um, and it's uh, no dis it's not dissimilar to the ice hockey professional game as well. Here in Sheffield, uh, you've got you've got the Sheffield Steelers, who are very successful too. And that's a, you know we're running it on a similar lines to the ice hockey franchise in the UK and. So we, you know, we're we're comparative. When we talk about franchises, um, one of the things that, well, the idea of a franchise, right, is that you're buying a almost an instruction manual of how to take on take on that brand and deliver whatever it is that you're you're buying into. You know, if I'm spending 150 grand with the BBL, what am I getting in return for that? Like, what uh, are you providing to me that's going to help my franchise thrive? Well, we try and provide as much advice as we can. There is there is a manual being written if you want to call it like you would get if you opened up a McDonald's franchise and say this is the manual. And this is what you do each day. But we do uh, provide for the club um, what it is that you are responsible for. And then on top of that, as I say, all the clubs can support any organization. And we're always, as directors, able to provide support as well. Andy Webb at the centre provides every club with availability of how things are done. What is it that you need to do with um, uh, visas, employment contracts, etc. So the bones are all there. Can we put better meat on those bones? I think we should. And we are doing that. I think there's also more. Sorry, there, Paul. I just I think there's also more stuff that there's also the collective sale that we do centrally around around um, you know the supply of equipment around television. There's a huge amount of support around that. You know, support around referees. You don't have to go out and sell out your own referees. There's a lot of things that we do collectively at the centre to support that that franchise. Paul. Yeah. So I've operated franchises in ice hockey, and. Uh, or a franchise in ice hockey and I've been involved in rugby union and and the boards of those two sports in addition to the boards of this sport and I, I'll tell you now the levels of communication of, amongst this group are far in excess of the other two far in excess and much and, uh, significantly more amicable uh, as I hope you've seen today from this this call um, 
So there, there's always an open line. You know, I spent two and a half hours or so yesterday with Jamie Edwards um, on on a call. You know, supporting Jamie in, in his um, you know new new uh, new journey with uh, with the Manchester Giants. Obviously, Jamie's a an ex ex PBL player from the late eighties. Uh, with with great passion, great drive, saying to me, saying all the right things, and that that's a great indicator for us as well. By the way, that you know, we know we know when someone gets it. That makes sense, and yeah. feels right now that Jamie certainly does. He's a basketball guy, which helps, I think, um, in, in a lot of respects. So uh, the manual is great, but if you don't read the manual. And you leave it on the shelf, smoking <laughs> to anybody. Um, yeah. Our online services are free. <laughs> and, uh, we we try and keep as a, uh, as open the door as we possibly can. Yeah, because I was just going to say, you know, from the case in point everyone's talking about at the moment is obviously Solent based on what they've done this season uh, on the court. It's clear that they can compete. Um, but if I'm Solent, like really the incentive to join the BBL is pretty much based around the fact that I can say I'm playing in the professional league in this country. I don't feel like there's a lot more. Like, what do you, if you're trying to sell it to me, like, what would you say back to them? What would you say back to me saying that? Yeah, go on, Paul. So, uh, our nursery team is Newcastle University, who also play in EBL1 this season. And historically, uh, Northumbria University, who played in EBL1 for many years, um, won, the, won the league once, at least. Uh, great coach in March Stutel. Uh, could I sell a ticket to a game at that level uh, to a market that I already had and a database of similar to Vince's over 10,000 people know could I get press regionally struggled um, I think the offer at a regional level uh, for a club moving up into this league and the benefits that it provides that club are significantly higher than at the division below um, there is a there is a benefit. Um, I would always sell it that way. Um, I've, I've seen it for myself, so um, I think it would be great for Solent to move up. Spoke, you know, obviously spoke after the trophy final with the uh, the club, and uh, they would be a great asset. And the main reason they would be a great asset is because they are a basketball organisation, mm. like Reading, uh, like a Hemel. You know, they're, they're they're passionate about the sport. They understand the sport. And they've done a fantastic job of, um, you know, continuing to build and rebuilding a, a very famous franchise from the 80s. Yeah. Rich, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I will, because um, we were in the same boat sort of towards the late 90s with, with the Raiders. And, and I think not to contradict what Paul says, but it's a little bit of horses for courses. And it's the same uh, in everything we do. What works for Vince may not work for me, may work differently for Paul. We've got to create our own markets and, and our business structure needs to needs to be different in each market. So um, for us in Plymouth, we, we were selling out the Plymouth Pavilions when we were in um, MBL1 or EBL1 or whatever it was at the time. Um, uh, we were getting um, huge press coverage. We were getting TV coverage. We were going to finals and things. But I, I think for for the club, um, yeah, it is a massive jump up. I mean, money wise, it, it's to be able to compete at that uh, bigger level. It is a jump up, and the professionalism is a jump up. Um, but I think you, you've got to aspire to be the best you can. And Solent have proved this year that they can do a great job. They went away to to Manchester, and I'm so sorry, Vince, but. Obviously, they went to London as well and, and, and um, had a, a fantastic win. And, you know, why wouldn't they want to try and prove themselves in the top league? Um, they certainly should, in my opinion. It'd be brilliant to have them. Absolutely fantastic to have them. When we're talking about the uh, average value of a BBL franchise, you know, obviously, we've got a franchise fee of 150000 And then if we're talking about a salary, a salary cap of 200000 like, if we were to average out what you think the value of a franchise is, uh, well, in fact, maybe Rich and Vince can talk about this because selling a stake, I would assume, puts a value on it. Um, what, what would you say is the value of, a, of an average BBL team? Uh, maybe you don't want to go into the specific, specifics of yours. If you do, it would be more than more than uh, welcome to. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to know kind of like the, the value of a, of a club. Rich? 
Uh, yeah, well, essentially, it's, it's the value of, of anything. Um, it's, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it at the end of the day. Um, and it depends what they want to get out of it. Um, you know, I think if you looked at a lot of BBL clubs on paper, they, they may not look like they're, they're worth anything, um, whereas some clubs look like they're worth a huge amount. Um, but, I mean, certainly for us, for, for in terms of the investment we brought on board, um, Bow Global are, are one of the, the biggest educational providers worldwide, and MLA College, who are based in Plymouth, um, for, for them, it's about giving back a little bit as well. They Sport and education is, is just huge for Bow. Um, they own a team in Turkey as well. So when they started working in Plymouth a number of years ago and, and saw that there was a basketball team and, and they already own a Super League team in Turkey, so they're very used to the way basketball operates, albeit over here on a much smaller scale financially. Um, but for them, it was it was a case of, well, you know, well, what can we put in to make a difference? Um, uh, so the discussions were, were along those lines and, and the money was really about investment into the club. It, it certainly wasn't about anyone making any money and, and we haven't made any money. It's about bringing the right partners into the Plymouth Raiders, but also the BBL as well, because, you know, what's good for us is good for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you're quite right. It's worth. It's only worth what anyone's prepared to pay pay for it. Um, but uh, there is a very loose calculation you can use if you want. Uh, which uh, and I'll, so I'll ask you, Sam, for the number. So the question I would ask you is, how much is a seat, a basketball seat, one seat? How much would you say is an average basketball seat? What in the BBL? Yeah. Well, or anyway, I mean, I'm going to a professional let's, basketball game in England. You know, is it five, ten, fifteen? What is it? Let's say a tenner. So it's tenner. So we have a six thousand seat a venue, ten pound a seat. Uh, six thousand seats is sixty thousand. Uh, ten games is six hundred thousand. Twenty games a season is one point two million. So theoretically, if we had someone out there who knew how to sell tickets, that building is worth one point two million a year. That's before you do anything with players. That's before you do anything with sponsorships. That's before you do anything at all. That's just an average seat. It's ten pounds. Can we sell it? Because there's a lot of people outside think they can sell tickets. You know. Um, so my answer to you is it's what anybody wants to pay for, but you decide what the average ticket is and you work it out that way around. And, and really that's depending on what your ambitions are, because those ambitions may be different. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. There's, there's, sorry, on, just one last thing just to add into that. There's also other things to add in is what's the turnover of your organizations? What assets do you have? What's the infrastructure? What contracts of sponsorship and other things do you already have in place? And, um, and what have you done over the last 10 years to prove that? So that there's value in all of that partnership workings and aspect of that as well. So, um, And every club is a little different on that. And I think that's where, again, um, like you said already, it's only, what, what, it's only worth what someone will pay for it and what they value it that to be worth as well. Correct. Cool. Okay, just a final thing then, future of the BBL. Let's talk about five-year five, five year vision, uh, maybe 10-year, five, five and 10-year vision kind of. What do you see in the future? Um, what are you aspiring to be? Where do you see it going? Start with you, Yuri. And then when you finish, if you hand it over, we'll do a quick round table and then we'll wrap it up. So mine, uh, I, not to overcomplicate this and do it really simply, to me, the future of the BBL is about every franchise being in a venue that they control that they can control the revenues more significantly than they currently are now so if it's owning it or being in control of it that will grow the bbl and the clubs within it singularly the most effective thing and after that i'd like to see us on a regular terrestrial weekly channel in addition to all our other video and social media and all the other outlets. I still believe that the once a week regular game gives us a footprint that's still understood. Those are the two things. I'll Perfect. pass it on. Uh, Vince? The only thing that... Okay, me. Um, um, what's the future of the BBL? I mean, I think that the future of the BBL is, is promising right now. I think that in five years' time, we should be looking for five teams playing in Europe on a regular basis. I think... Um, sad as this COVID situation has been, I think it has raised a number of possibilities for the game, this sport. Um, I think it maybe brings us a little closer to our European neighbours. Um, and from our perspective at the club, you know, we hope to bring superstar British players through the system mm -hmm. and have an opportunity where they can be recognised uh, out and about so we can actually promote the game in that way. Ross? Okay, so the only thing I, I would add into what Vince and Yuri have already said... Um, 
is the fact of uh, that pathway opportunity, trying to deal with that pathway opportunity for British players uh, and seeing more British players coming through the BBL pathway and, and, and whether that's studying at university here and that aspect of stuff. Um, and I think in five years' time, if, if somehow we can, can, can manage and deal with that, I think that would be a big step forward for us as well. Rich? Um, I wish I'd gone first because I'd have had all those things basically. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, in addition to that, bringing bringing back as many GB players and and uh, as Russ says, if we can come up with a pathway whereby um, uh, we we're maybe not putting off the best of our talent going to the states and learning their skills, but um, but bringing them back. But we've made no um, secret about the fact that we want to be playing in Europe within the next uh, three or four years. You know, for that we need a venue. I'd love to see everyone in the country working towards that. And it's it's interesting that, you know, people say, well, why don't you let these teams in that have only got seven, eight hundred seats? But uh, as a league, if we start saying that's acceptable, that's when the standards drop again. Um, but also it gives arguments for local councils to say, well, hang on a second, the BBL are letting people in. So why should we work with you on building a two and a half thousand seat arena? Um certainly for us in Plymouth, it's about it's about having that arena. It's about the league as a whole getting bigger and better but but I think you need to look at somewhere like Australia and see what's happened over there when we've had big well when they had big investments in in Melbourne for example which you know aren't dissimilar to the the investments that certainly we've got and um uh, and Vince has got that that's propelled the league to another level and the Australian league is now one of the top 10 leagues in the world and it's all because originally a, a number of teams had that investment so if you were to look externally at basketball around the world and try and identify an untapped market, here we are. Basically, GB basketball should be way, way bigger than it is. And all it needs is a little bit of money. Paul? Um, is there anything else to say? I suppose just, just to add to what the guys have already said, we need improve improve national profile to... Um, at the very least, match what some of us experience at regional level. Uh, we've, we've definitely got to um, square that circle, uh, which in hand would give us a better profile for the fantastic finals events that the league currently put on. You know, which is one of the big positives yeah. that's, that's happened over, over recent years. You know, ten thousand sellout for the cup final with a great ticket spend. Mm. Yeah, that 20 years ago, we'd have a great uh, sellout final without a great ticket spend. Um, you know, look good, but but not where we are now. So so you know, anything to help profile the the, the playoff final at the O2 uh, and the other two main events will will help keep the league on. Um, ultimately, like I said before, sell more tickets, sell more sponsorship, and and equally, I'd like to still see, although there's a balance to this league expansion you know I'd, I'd always hope that we get ourselves to 18 teams i think the sport needs more professional clubs um that's what breaks the mold from regional international mm. uh you know you don't have to go very far from one town to another to come across another professional basketball club that's that's the real uh nut to crack for me so but from a purely from a bbl perspective um you know for me, but increased media profile. Perfect. That's a awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It is much appreciated. And maybe we'll do another one at some point in the future. Thanks. Thank Sam. you very much, Thanks, Sam. Sam. Thanks. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Sam.